thinner woman. It's the only place of real worship, bowing to the king. Now, tonight, I want you to take your Bible, if you will, and turn to Philippians chapter 4. And do you already have a fill-in-the-blank sheet for tonight? Did they already get that to you? All right, we'll get it handed out to you here in just a couple of minutes. I think they're on the back table back there. Before we do, let's do this. Let's look at the passage of Scripture here in Philippians chapter 4. And why don't you just stand together with me, and we're going to read it out loud together here, straight from the screen up here, okay? Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 6. Read it out loud together with me. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Stop right there just a minute. I forgot to tell you. When you're studying the scriptures, you maybe already do this, but you ought to look for key phrases or repeated words, all right? I want you to do that tonight in this passage for the, for the scriptures, okay? Look for repeated words, and I'll give you a hint. What I'm looking for is not the whatsoever in verse 8, okay? Let's go, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoice, Lord, greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can anybody tell me the word I'm looking for? Things. You see it? Thing, thing, things, 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 things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Tonight we're going to talk about how to handle things. We have all got things in our life. Did you know that you got a, you got a plate full of things? We're going to talk from the scriptures. I, I love how practical the word of God is, folks. And too many times we don't get into it to see just how relevant it is to our everyday life. Life. Hopefully tonight this will help you to see that. Father, we surrender ourselves to you. Help us to see tonight from the word of God, Lord, through the example of Paul, how to deal with things. And God, give us obedient, tender hearts because we face things every day in life, not just when we're sitting in a church service at night. Lord, some of us came in here carrying a bunch of things. I'm not talking about children. Lord, I'm talking about the issues of life that we face every day. And I pray that you will cause us as your blood-bought believers to begin to apply to everyday life from you how to deal with things by your grace and by your spirit. All God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Yeah, tonight we're going to talk about how to handle things. You ever run into people and they seem to be a little discouraged about something? You say, what's wrong? They say, oh, I don't know. Oh, come on, what's wrong? It's just things. Well, we've all got things going on in our life. And as I was reading this passage one day, I was, uh, I was arrested with how many things Paul had to say about things. And everybody loves to claim verse 13 there a few minutes. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Many people have it as their life verse. By the way, have you ever looked at some verses of scripture and thought, I wonder what it would be like if that verse had been written on the basis of my life? How about like, he heard me and delivered me from most of my fears. Doesn't that sound encouraging? Oh man, I got to claim that for my life. 
No, I sought the Lord. He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. How about this one? I can do most things through Christ who strengthens me. Boy, there's a life verse, isn't it? Or how about this one? But my God shall supply half your needs. Oh, oh, excuse me. That's right. The power of verse 13 where Paul says, I can do all things through Christ, is because he's sharing with us how he learned that. Now, by the way, here's a subtitle for this message tonight, okay? Here it is. How to conquer fear, worry, anxiety, stress, depression, nervousness, impatience, frustration, and anger. Amen, Amen or oh me? Huh? You got any of those things in your life? You say, how long are we going to be here? I don't know. Let's just get at it, okay? How to handle things. And Paul tells us right here in this passage how to handle things. So let's look at it. First of all, he says, be anxious. Now, the, the King James word is careful. What that word means is be full of care about nothing. Be anxious over nothing. Did you notice that nothing is a, what are they called, a compound word? Some of you English teachers or somebody help. What, what's the words in Nothing. No, thank So how many things am I... By the way, you can, you can respond to me here, okay? How many things am I supposed to be anxious about, class? No, no. Not, not even one? No. Nothing. You say, oh, yeah, Tim, that's easy preaching, hard living. I, that was easy for Paul to write, but I got to live it in daily life. Wait just a minute. Can anybody tell me where Paul was when he wrote this? He's in prison. This is one of the prison epistles. And Paul doesn't hesitate to say, look, even if you're in prison, be anxious over nothing. Now, why could Paul say that? You ever had things that might create anxiety in your life? Huh? I, I, we've had a few of them. Here's a beautiful place. You know what that is? That's St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And a number of years ago, one of our teams had the opportunity of going to the U.S. Virgin Islands, the St. Croix, for a revival crusade. They asked us which one. Can you believe that we volunteered for that? <laughs> we did. And we came together on that island. We set up a big circus tent that we had to send over there. And in that circus tent, we had a, a miracle in itself. We got 10 Baptist churches on the island together for revival. Now, look, you almost got revival just by getting a Baptist to agree to do anything. Did you know that? And we had these 10 Baptist churches together on that island crying out to God for revival, and God was doing an incredible thing. One, I mean, folks, it's a beautiful place. You know, it's an island. It's 24 miles long and about 7 miles wide at the widest point of it. All right? And it's just an incredible plot. I mean, wouldn't you like to? We were there for a revival meeting. The, the, the ocean, the waters were just so beautiful out there. And God had provided for us. I don't know if this pointer will show. Yeah, God had provided for us a home of some people who lived in America but weren't there. They were in the process of selling their home, didn't have much furniture in it. But it was way up in the mountain area. Nancy, which end is Christian stead at? Is this it? What? Other side, okay, over here. And it was way up in the mountains here, and we could look out on the waters from where we are just about a half mile down there. It was just beautiful, you know. We're there with all of our kids up in this place and having a great revival crusade for the first week until Hurricane Lenny <laughs> decided to hit. Folks, to this day in St. Croix, they call it wrong way Lenny, because it was the only hurricane that came through and across and over into the Gulf and stayed there. It was there the whole first week of the revival crusade, and on the second Sunday, it decided to start moving back east. And it came back across and hit us. And in the U.S., everybody was reporting about what's going to happen to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico got a whole lot worse this time with, uh, was it Irma or... Irma. Yeah, than, than it did during this one. But you know what was getting hit? This is St. Croix right here, folks. And that's where we were. Now, when a hurricane comes like that, the first thing we did was we went back down. We, we got a group of men together, and we took down that tent. And you don't evacuate an island when a hurricane's coming. Did you know that? You just hunker down. 
And some of our team members, about half of our team, Hess Oil owns about half the island because they have oil reserves and all this stuff. And so they've gone out there and they built a whole bunch of these nice homes and so on for the uh, uh, double wides for all of their employees. Half of our team were staying with people who work for Hess Oil. And so when they have a storm like this, they've got a huge storm shelter that they go into. And if the houses are gone, the houses are gone, but they're safe inside the shelter. My youth pastor came back after this was all over with me. He said, Timmy, the only reason I knew there was a hurricane on the island is because I was watching it on the computer screens. And for us and some of the others who had to hunker down in the houses where we were, we said to him, uh, you know, Trent, you may not want to be sharing that with the team members that are just glad to have their life today. It was a Category 4, 5, 150-mile-an-hour winds as it came across, folks. And in our house that we were in, I watched these large, beautiful sliding glass doors that were great to look out, you know, with beautiful weather and about half mile down. But at this point, they're going... I took the only furniture they had left in the living room was a couch. I took that, put a love seat on top of it, put it up against them. The front door was dead bolted in the middle of that storm. It sucked open. Our kids... I had, I had put one mattress in the bathroom. We were planning, if necessary, to all get in the tub and put that mattress over us and praying for our lives. The walls were made out of stucco and concrete. You know, you had bricks, uh, uh, concrete blocks and stuff. Folks, when that hurricane was coming through, we could tell you every block on that wall because the water was sucking in and coming through all the blocks, and it was going down this long hallway, and Nancy and I the whole time are mopping this hallway, and our kids are running down this long hallway and sliding and slipping. They were having a great time. <laughs> During Hurricane Lenny, we didn't know if we would survive that. But I told my kids, trying to get some excitement in the midst of this death threat, I said, you know what? You remember that, that T-shirt factory we saw downtown where they've produced thousands and thousands of T-shirts and stuff? I said, listen, if we survive this hurricane, we're going to go down there and we're all going to buy T-shirts that say, I survived Hurricane Lenny. My kids got all excited. Really, Dad? You think they're happy? Oh, so I guarantee you they will. For the first three days after the hurricane finished, and folks, we watched palm trees like this that literally bowed down and hit the ground and yet kept their root. And we stayed through all of that thing when it was all over with. For the first 48 hours, it was against the law to drive because they had no electricity on the island. They were afraid of vandalism and stuff like that and curfews and stuff. Well, the third day, we were finally able to get out. We went by that T-shirt factory and the whole front of it. I mean, hundreds of T-shirts up there. I survived Hurricane Lenny. We bought one for each of our kids. Most of our team members got them before we left. There's mine. I survived Hurricane Lenny. Now, you can see this is the satellite picture, and right there is St. Croix. Category 4, 5 hurricane, November 1999. We've got different situations that God has brought into our lives. When Nancy was pregnant with our twins, we had been praying, Lord, it would be great if they could be born early. You see, you know what it's like to travel on the road and have to have your kids wherever you are on the road. At least that's what we had to do with each of our kids and so on. And each month, we'd have to find another doctor that's willing to give her, I used to say inspection, who'd be willing to give her a checkup and see how everything was going on. And I never had a single doctor who said, you know, the best thing you can do for your pregnant wife is travel all over the country like a gospel gypsy, taking her from church, town, town, so on, that kind of stuff. We've been praying for them to be born early. However, in January, when we left Michigan in freezing weather, zero-degree weather, and headed back on the road to Texas for our next crusade, and they had not been born. She was eight and a half months pregnant with the twins at that point. We got out of Michigan, headed down the road. Some of you heard part of this before. We got over into Illinois, and this occurred. Our truck caught on fire. I had 30 seconds to get that vehicle stopped on the side of the road, get our kids out of the car. I mean, it was engulfed in flames just like that. I had to get them back in the trailer. We waited a few minutes for the state police to come. And when they, it was, it was freezing, zero degree weather, snow all over the place. You can see some of the snow around here. Zero degree weather. I got them back in the trailer. Finally, the state police came. I can't, took them, moved them back into that. And all we could see from the police car was just the flames shooting up on both sides as our truck and trailer going up in flames. I went back there and sat in the front seat of the sheriff's car. My family's all in the back seat behind the squirrel cage there, you know. 
There's the three kids. There's Nancy, eight and a half months pregnant with twins, and sitting right on top of the twins was Gideon. He was our cat. <laughs> they wouldn't let me leave him in the trailer. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have left him there anyway, folks. Honestly, he was my baby. I turned around in that car. I looked at them. I said, what do we need to do? One of my boys spoke up and said, Daddy, we need to thank God. We did. The next day, all of our trucks, all of our coats were burned up in that. You see, we had them laying down there and so on. The next day, it's freezing. We've got to get on down to Texas. They brought another trailer vehicle down there for us to drive and head on down that way. But all of our coats had burned up. We didn't carry credit cards back then. I carried travel cash. And so I went and I started rummaging through. You see the dash of what used to be the dash right here. I started rummaging. Our, we carried three things up there. Our atlas, our personal mileage logbook for the government to know our miles and so on, and our travel cash. We carried in one of those bank envelopes, you know, with the zippered material cloth envelope up there. I went back, started rummaging through. Atlas, gone. Personal mileage book, gone. I kept on rummaging, and I found the white paper bank envelope sitting on that dash with $400 in $20 bills sitting there. I took that thing. I had to buy uh, uh, coats for the kids and stuff. We went down to Montgomery Ward, and we're buying coats and so on. I go up to the counter to pay for one of them. My son, who is now a missionary in Africa, my son stood there beside me, tugging on my pants leg, and said, Daddy, tell her about the miracle. I started pulling out these $20 bills to pay for the coat. She looked at them. She said, these are kind of, kind of look like they're burned. He said, Daddy, tell her about the miracle. Folks, I kept the worst of those $20 bills to this day. And that's the bank envelope. I used to carry them with me. Now I just have a picture of them. That's the worst of the $20 bills. So we're never broke, okay? I've still got $20 there if I need to go out and spend it somewhere. <laughs> Sometimes if we're not aware of the grace of God in the midst of circumstances, folks, we miss the miracle of what God's trying to teach us. And it's through things that God teaches us these things. And that's why Paul said, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and thanksgiving and so on. Now, let's talk about this. Why could Paul say be anxious for nothing? Because there were some indisputable and unchangeable things about God that he had a grasp on. Now, I want you to look at this passage of Scripture and from where you are, I want you to read it together with me. This is Romans chapter 8, okay? Let's read it together. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all... Wait a minute, what's that next word? All. all. Things. things. All things? How about some things? Oh, sorry. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory to God, folks. Amen. 
If that don't bless you, your blesser's busted. Did you know that? I mean, that'll preach right there. What is Paul saying in this passage? Let's look at it. Here's what he's saying. Number one, God is sovereign. You know what that means? God is in control. God is never caught off guard. There's never a plan B with God. I love this statement, not original with me, but I wish it was. Did it ever occur to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? Wow. Think about that. Did it ever occur to you that nothing has ever occurred? Now, there's never been something God said, oh, well, looky there. I didn't know that was going to happen. What am I going to do now? God is sovereign. Here's the second thing we find. God is always working for his glory and for our good. It doesn't say that all things are good. It says that all these things are working together for good, for the glory of God in your life as a blood-bought child of God. Here's the third thing. This one blows me away. God is for us. Would you just personalize that one minute and just say, God is for me? Do it. God is for for us. How can he be for us? Well, you're not going to have time to write this down. Don't get mad at me. Just look real quick, just for a minute. How do I know God is for us? Well, we've been adopted into his family as his children. His Holy Spirit lives in us. Jesus is my brother. You're going to share in his glory. He didn't spare his own son. And if he gave his own son, will he not with him also freely give us all things? He will graciously give what you need, and you cannot be separated from the love of God. How's that for eternal security, friend? God is for us. The next thing Paul knew is that God is always working from an eternal perspective. We don't understand that sometimes. God is always working from an eternal perspective. He sees what you and I cannot see. Do you know what his determined purpose is for me, folks? He is determined that I'm going to be like Jesus. And sometimes I cooperate with him, and sometimes I kick against the pricks. And by the way, you do too. Kind of like that person came to Michelangelo that time, and he'd, he'd taken and he'd, he'd carved out of stone and stuff this beautiful horse, and the detail and stuff was just so incredible. And people looked at it and said, how in the world can a man, how could he take a piece of solar and do something like that? Michelangelo said, it was really quite simple. They said, quite simple, what do you mean? He said, yeah, I just took that piece of granite and I knocked off anything that didn't look like a horse. Do you know what God's in the process with you and me of doing? He said, nope, that's not like my son. Let's take care of that. <laughs> nope. God is working from an eternal perspective, and God loves you. It's not based on feeling. It's not based on your circumstances or your things being everything that you want them to be. Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's why he says, be anxious for nothing. Be full of care over nothing. Secondly, what does he say? Pray with thanksgiving in everything. Now, I want to share something. I wish, I honestly wish, Pastor and I were talking about this. There's a message I preached last time I was here on the joy of bitterness. I honestly wish I had an hour to talk about the issue of bitterness. But here's something I want you to understand, dear child of God. There is a difference between being thankful and thanking God. Thankfulness is an emotion. Thanking God is an act of your will. You will never be thankful until you thank God. What is the key to finding God in things and circumstances of life? Pray with giving of thanks. You say, Tim, if you knew what happened to me, you wouldn't tell me to thank God. Yes, I would. Why? Because that's what the scriptures 
tell us to do, folks. Listen, in everything, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, write down the scriptures if you want to. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Well, say, which part does that will of God go with, the, the giving of thanks or the things? The answer is yes. <laughs> it goes with both of them. How about this one, Ephesians 5, 20, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did it say? Giving thanks how often? Always. For how much? Everyone. For all things in the name of the Father. You say, Tim, if you knew what happened to me, you wouldn't tell me to thank God. Let me tell you why I would. You say, for me to thank God for that would be a great sacrifice. Possibly so. That's why the writer of Hebrews said this. By him, therefore, let us offer to God the sacrifice of praise. What is that sacrifice of praise? Listen, even the fruit of our lips giving thanks. When you thank God for difficult things, it brings God into the picture. Amen. That's why he said, when you pray... Pray, giving thanks in everything. That's so important. Thirdly, he said, I want you to think on these things. What were they? Whatever things are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of a good report, I won't take time to go into them, but this is what those words in the original language mean. Things that are truthful and revealing things that are honorable and venerable, things that are equitable, righteous, related to justice, things that are innocent, things that are acceptable, that are of a friendly nature, things that are reputable and well-spoken of. Why is it important, first of all, that we start with true things? If you want to get a perspective on dealing with things, we must have the Word of God Amen. burned into our hearts continuously. How do I learn the mind of Christ? Do you know that everything that is biblical and solid that you've ever learned about Jesus, you learned right here? And people who are seeking a word from God, you wouldn't have to be constantly seeking a word from God if you were more familiar with the word of God. I like what one scholar said. He said, people are wanting to hear the voice of God. He said, if you want to hear the voice of God, open your Bible and read out loud. Because that is God's word for us. Think on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and so on, things that are well spoken of. We must get a right mindset related to things. And then fourthly, he said, obey these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. What does the word do mean? We sang it tonight. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And I like that one verse that we sang. I'm so glad we didn't leave it out tonight, Dwight. Listen to it. But we never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. Somebody asked a theologian one time, what does that word all there really mean? He thought about it for a minute. And he said, well, all means all, and that's all all means. We never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. Listen, for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for those who sit back on their blessed assurance and do nothing, right? No, for all who will Trust and obey. And you, look, you can't do one without the other. Amen. It's like the book of James. Show me your faith by your works. I'll show you my, uh, show, you, show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. How do I know somebody's trusting God? An obedient life. And that's why he says, obey. Do what you know you're supposed to do. Paul said, listen, the things that you've learned by personal experience, put it to practice. He said, the things that you've received by exposure to godly men and women teaching the scriptures, those things, do them. The things that you've heard by way of explanation, somebody says, this is how it works. Okay, I'll try that. I'll obey that. And then he said, the things of example, what you, Paul said, what you have seen in me do. You remember how Paul 
wrote and he said, follow me as I follow Christ. Where did he learn that? How did Jesus get his disciples? What did he tell them? Follow Follow me. And Paul was able to say, you follow me and you'll be following Christ. Wow. How's that for a challenge, dear friend? How many areas of your life could you say to another believer, you do this the way I do it and you'll be following Christ? You love your kids the way I love my kids. You'll be following Christ. You love your wife like I'm loving my wife. You'll be following Christ. You submit and serve your husband. You honor your parents the way I honor my parents, and you'll be following Christ. You live your life this way, and you'll be following. Paul said, those things which you both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, we need a special note to self right here, folks. Here's the note to self. Look at this in the passage. Obedience to verse 6. What did it say? Don't be anxious. Pray with thanksgiving and so on. What did he say in verse 7? The end result of that would be. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard. You know what? That, that's a military term. It means it will set up a guard around your mind and your heart. It will set up a guard. The peace of God, which passes understanding, shall keep your hearts and your mind. Dear friends, I, I shared with you the other night. We shared some friends of ours who used to be with us on the team. Six children and their three-year-old died two days ago. Drowned in a grease vat behind a restaurant. Out there playing, the wood on the top of that cover was rotten. She fell through. She's with Jesus today. I have no words. Our hearts have hurt. I, I've been awake at night, woke up during the night thinking about Corey and Tracy, what they're going through. But you know, look, look what he said. If you will pray and thank God, the peace of God will set up a garrison around your heart and your mind. And one of the responses from somebody back to them... <laughs> They set up a donation place where people could give toward the funeral. And one of the men, I read his response. He said, I was one of the EMTs at that setting. He said, it was my final week of training. He said to the family, he said, seeing you all in your response, my life will never be the same. Seeing how a Christian responds to difficult things. Now, notice the second part. According to this, if we will obey verse 9, and the God of peace, do you see that? The peace of God and the God of peace. So if we will obey those things which we both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace. Look here. We've got the peace of God and the presence of God. In the midst of things. So, here's what we see so far, folks. We must develop a mindset to think on those things that are true and honest and just. You know what the devil wants to do? It's been his trick ever since the Garden of Eden is to get people to question the integrity of God, is it not? Yea, hath God said. You know why God didn't want you to eat from that tree. He's trying to keep you from something. And ever since then, he's tried to get man to question the integrity of God. And that's why Paul says, you've got to develop a mindset of thinking right thoughts about God, true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and so on. Secondly, an activation of the will that says, I am going to obey what I know is right to do. Who was it, Dr. Bob Jones Sr., I think, that said, when all else fails, do right. Till the stars fall out, do right. What you know you ought to do, do it. What did the mother of Jesus tell the servants? Whatever he says to you, do it. Amen. Hmm? What would it have been like for the man born blind, John chapter 9, when Jesus says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam? What if he said, yeah, I'll get around that someday? <laughs> not today. What if he would not have obeyed? 
How many times in the scriptures do we see one of these words? Immediately, straightway, or forthwith. Why? Because God wants us to obey instantly what he tells us to do. We sang a song from Ruth Green the other night. There was another song they did back in those days. Obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. What is obedience? Doing exactly what I'm told to do, when I'm told to do it, with the right heart attitude. How you doing on that one? Huh? Obedience is doing exactly what I'm told to do, when I'm told to do it, and if you're not told when to do it, it's to be soon that you should do it instantly. Thirdly, with the right heart attitude. Now, I don't know about you, but I found out I can usually handle two out of the three of those on my own. I might do what I'm supposed to do. I might even do it when I'm supposed to do it. You know where I struggle? Attitude. Now, I know I'm the only person in here that ever struggles with that, so I just thought I'd admit that to you, okay? <laughs> I know you always have such a great attitude about everything God tells you to do. Yeah? You think so? You weren't in my car today, were you? No, but I was in mine, so... Here's the next thing he says, be instructed in all things. Listen, that's the heart. Do you hear what Paul said? Everywhere and in all things I am instructed. Dear friend, don't ever lose a teachable spirit. Every time I get a new Bible, the first passage I turn to is Proverbs chapter 4 where it says, Keep instruction for she is thy life. And I write out beside that a prayer, God, please don't let, let me ever lose a teachable spirit. Amen. I was with a pastor during a revival crusade. This pastor was, what, Bobby, at that point, 50, 60, 65 years old or something like that. Yeah, young, getting younger all the time. <laughs> He'd pastored for 40-some years longer than I'd ever been saved. And I'm preaching in this large church, this pastor. I go into staff meeting the next day. And the first thing he does is opens his Bible and says, Oh, Brother Tim, let me tell you what God showed me last night during your message. <laughs> I said, God, don't let me ever lose a teachable spirit. When you lose a teachable spirit, you're dead, spiritually speaking. Every man is my teacher. Every one of them has been somewhere that I haven't been. And Paul said, look, whether I abound or whether I'm suffering need, I have learned in whatsoever I state I am, even Minnesota, Amen. to be content. You say, that's easy. Well, we could mention other states, but we won't go into that, okay? Everywhere in all states, I have learned how to be content. Whether I am abased or whether I am abounding, whether I have more than I need or whether I'm suffering need. In the midst of every bit of it, he was always saying, God, what do you want to teach me through this? Would to God we could quiet our hearts to learn through things. I wonder what Paul was learning when he's sitting there in jail because of following Christ. We don't have to wonder. He shared it with us. Amen. Didn't he? He said, let me share with you out of my life how I've learned to handle things. And then you let Christ show his strength through you in all things. It's a powerful life's verse. But Paul could claim it. How many of us could? I can do all things through Christ. He wasn't just making this spiritual statement. He's suffering for his faith. He's thinking back on all the torturing that's gone on with him. Left in the deep and let down in a, in a basket over a wall for his life. Left under a pile of rocks. People thought he was dead. By the way, there was nobody out there at that point praying for Paul's healing. Did you know that? But God wasn't finished with him. He shook the rocks off, went back into town, and continued preaching. Because God wasn't finished with him. He said, let Christ show his strength through you in all things. Okay, so let's wrap it up here. 
Turn it over on the back and you can see this. You see, things are not meant to make us fearful. Be anxious over nothing. Instead, things are to teach us to surrender and commune with God. I have to tell you this in honest confession. When things occur in my life, usually, usually my first response is wrong. I'm reactionary. I get angry, rebellious. But you know what? Here's what is underlying all of that. Underneath all of that, I really long to know Jesus Christ and to walk with him. And so even though my initial response may be wrong, it's like God knows when I settle down, I'm going to get on my face and say, now God, what do you want to teach me through this? Sometimes God will allow you to flunk the pop quiz so you can pass the final exam. Did you know that? And thank God he's a lot more patient with me than I am. All right? <laughs> things are to teach us to surrender and commune with God. Thirdly, in things we learn to reflect accurately on the nature and the character of God. That's why I said think, think true things, honest, just, pure, lovely. If there's a good report, if there's any virtue, any praise, think on those things. And things we have to remember to obey the things that we've learned from God, his word, and others. Sometimes the reason things get the best of us is because we're not obeying what we know to do. And therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. sin. And then things are the laboratory of life. I love that phrase where we develop relationship with God. And then finally, things are where the power of Christ is demonstrated in our lives. Have you ever had somebody come up to you, they see your response to something, and they come up and they say something like this, are you for real? I had somebody who somewhere came across a few of my messages, started listening to them. He called someone who knew me intimately and said, is this guy for real? That man's testimony was, yeah, he is. I'll send you a few more tapes. We had the opportunity of meeting that man after that fellowshipping some with he and his wife to this day. They support us in ministry. Now, you don't get real so people can support you. But God has ways of vindicating and honoring a walk with him. I believe this is true about ministry. It's probably true about most things in life. If you will take care of the depth of your life, God will take care of the breadth of your ministry. You want to impact your neighbors? You want to impact those people you work with? You want to impact those people at school? Walk with Jesus. Amen. That's right. And the time will come like it did for me. I shared it with you last night where I walked up to a guy and said, hey, what is it about you? Something's different about you. Is that what Peter said? Be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks. Amen. Who's doing the asking? They are. To everyone who asks you a reason of the hope that is within you. Be ready. How do we learn that? By finding God in 